Hey, welcome to Fellowship Fayetteville. My name's Michael. I serve on the community team here. What a weekend to be in Fayetteville. Yesterday, my wife, Lee, said it feels like the whole world has come to Northwest Arkansas this weekend. U of A graduation over the last couple days. Congratulations to all our graduates and to the families who helped them graduate. We got high school graduations coming up this week, so we're just celebrating all around. Last weekend, we celebrated Mother's Day, which was a lot of fun, but I'm looking forward to the next one. Father's Day, right? And we all know, dads are notoriously hard to buy for. I know I'm hard to buy for, because most dads are like me. If I want something, and I can afford it, I buy it. So the things that I want that I don't have, I can't afford, which means my kids can't afford it either. It makes me hard to buy for. So, I thought we'd start off this morning with just some gift giving ideas. What do you get for the man who has everything? So I'm gonna show you three sets of two gifts, but here's the thing. Only one of these is real. So I want you to see if you can guess which one of these products that might be a good Father's Day gift is real. Maybe dad needs some personal care items. Maybe dad would like to have some bacon scope. <laughs> Maybe dad would like that salty goodness of bacon every morning and to have the delightful breath that that can bring all day long. Or maybe dad would like to have deodorant that smells like freshly minted money. Which one of these do y'all think is a real product? Who thinks the mouthwash is real? Who thinks the deodorant's real? It's the deodorant, that's a real product. You can make yourself smell like money. You can buy it on Amazon. All right, how about this one? Maybe dad's not so much in to personal care. Maybe dad likes to eat. Which of these is real? Krispy Kreme donut spread. You can make anything you're about to eat as delicious as a Krispy Kreme donut. Or savory soda pops. Sodas that taste like buffalo wings or ranch dressing. Who doesn't want carbonated ranch dressing? Who thinks the donut spread's the real one? Who thinks the sodas are the real ones? The sodas are the real ones. Ah, oh. But Krispy Kreme, anybody in here works for Krispy Kreme, get on it. That's the product we need right there. Maybe dad's not a foodie, but everybody wears shoes. Everybody needs a pair of shoes. Do you think... The grass flip-flop so that dad can enjoy walking on fresh cut grass wherever he goes is real. Or how about the T-Mobile sidekick that has the technology of a cell phone in your shoe? Who thinks the grass shoe's real? Who thinks the phone shoe's real? It's the grass shoe. <laughs> Those of you who thought the phone shoe was real might have watched too much Get Smart growing up. All right, I'm bringing this up because... The man who has everything is the man in our passage today. The man who comes to Jesus, he's a royal official. He's got the job, he's got the salary, he's got the position, he's got the family, but he's up against something he can't control. He can't get his son well, and so he's desperately turning to Jesus. Let's look at it together. It's gonna be in John chapter four, which is page 64 in your John book, by the way. Have you noticed that the John book is designed for taking notes? All that white space is there for a reason. So consider bringing that to church and, and jotting some things down. If you haven't picked up a John book yet, they're still at the info booth. We're not quite halfway through this series. It's not too late to pick up one of those and use that book to help you understand God's word better. So here we are. We're in the second of our three series in John. We're in the series on the miracles or the signs. John highlights seven miracles, seven signs performed by Jesus, and we're working through those one by one. Last week, Clark told us about the purposes of those signs. He said the number one purpose is to attest to the true identity of Jesus. The miracles reveal that Jesus really is Israel's Messiah and the world's true king. They point to his deity. The miracles reveal Jesus as God made flesh. The next purpose is that they lead people to faith in Jesus. That's the purpose statement of the book of John. It's in John chapter 20, verse 31. He says, Jesus did a lot of other miracles, but these, these seven, they're recorded 
so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. So the miracles point us to faith in Christ. The third reason is they illustrate a deeper truth. The miracles point to something beyond just the miracle itself. For example, you heard the story read. Today, it points to the fact that Jesus has power over disease and death. And then lastly, these miracles, they preview a world to come, a world where there is no more death, there is no more disease, a world where everything has been put back like it was originally intended to be. So let's turn to the text, John chapter four. We're gonna begin in verse 46. Here's what we're gonna see. We're gonna see the ask as this man comes and and begs Jesus to do something for him. Then we're gonna see the belief as the man believes what Jesus tells him, and then lastly, we're gonna see the results. So let's look at verse 46. You might notice Kim read from the NIV, which is what I asked her to do. I'm gonna teach from the ESV, the English Standard Version. And it brings up a question that we get around here sometimes. What's the best translation? And we always say the same thing. The best translation is the one you will read. And so we're gonna look at what the ESV says. I'm gonna highlight some differences with the NIV, and the big idea is we're gonna use them both to try to get to the original meaning of what John was saying. So John 4, 46, it says, Jesus came again to Cana at Galilee. Now, we were in Cana last week, weren't we? For a wedding. But between John chapter two and John chapter four, a lot has happened. Look with me at this map of Israel. Down at the bottom, That's the Dead Sea, you follow the Jordan all the way up, and at the top, in the north of Israel, that's the Sea of Galilee. And Cana is just west of the Sea of Galilee. So last week, we were at that wedding, and then then in chapter three, Jesus travels all the way down to Jerusalem, goes to the Passover, clears the temple, that's the first temple clearing, we find that in John. He has his meeting with Nicodemus, then he travels north into Samaria, where he meets the woman at the well. That's in John 4. And now this week, he's returned to Cana. Let's zoom in on that area. You see Capernaum. It's there on the Sea of Galilee at about 11 o'clock on the sea. And then straight west from there is Cana. Cana's up in the hills. It's about 16 miles as the crow flies. So let's say 18 to 20 if you're traveling. And so this man... He comes to meet Jesus there in Cana. The passage says he's an official. The NIV said a royal official. The word is basikalos, and it means an official of the king. Now, the king that's in view here is probably Herod Antipas. He was the son of Herod the Great. He was the ruler of Galilee, this region that both Cana and Capernaum are in. And he was kind of a puppet king kept in power by the Romans. And so this official, this royal official, he was probably Jewish, we don't know for sure, but even as a Jew, he would have been despised by the people because he had a a good life that was maintained by oppressing them and by serving this puppet of Rome. But he probably had a good life, materially speaking, compared to most of the people around As I said, he had the salary, he had the position, but now he's run into something he can't fix. His son is sick and dying and he can't do anything about it. So when he hears that Jesus, this miracle worker, this man sent from God is is back in Galilee, is over in Cana, he goes there with a simple request. Come down to Capernaum and heal my son. And the way it's phrased in the Greek, it's, it's a repeated asking, it's a pleading. He's begging Jesus to come down. And look at Jesus' reply. Jesus said, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Man, it seems kind of cold, doesn't it? What's the deal with this response? I have to tell y'all, I'm kind of excited about this part of the teaching because it gives me a chance to talk about one of my favorite topics. In the New Testament, there are times that we have the plural form of you. 
And this is the English Standard Version. We don't speak standard English, do we? We speak Arkansas English. And we have a perfectly useful plural for you, which is y'all. How much does it change how we read this when we understand that Jesus says, unless y'all see signs and wonders, y'all will never believe. See, he's not just talking to the man. He's talking to the broader culture. He's talking to the Galileans. He's talking to the people who are gathered around hoping to see something cool. Now, the NIV says, unless you people, which I appreciate that because they're trying to demonstrate that he's not just talking to the man. And at the same time, I don't like it because the word people is not in the original, but I appreciate the effort, NIV translators. So what is Jesus getting at here? All of you Galileans, all of y'all, you wanna see a sign, you wanna see a miracle, you wanna see something spectacular, and I think the implication is you want the miracle more than you want me. You're more interested in seeing something cool than getting to know God made flesh. More interested in the sign than Jesus himself. And here's what's convicting about that. We're all that way sometimes. We can all find ourselves wanting the blessing more than we want the one who blesses us. Sometimes we're more interested in what God can do for us than in our relationship with God himself. We all have that friend, don't we? That friend that when their number comes up on your phone, you're like, what do they need? They only call when they need something. And if we're not careful, we can be that way with God. It's really easy to treat Jesus like that, to go through our life just doing our own thing until we hit that thing that our salary, our position, our material wealth, our intelligence can't fix. And then we want Jesus to solve our problem. Jesus is saying here, in effect, if only you would go beyond the signs and wonders so you could see me for who I really am. But the man continues to cry out for this act of mercy, come down before my child dies. And Jesus replies simply, go, your son will live. Now when we look at this carefully, did Jesus do what the man asked? No, he didn't. The man asked him to come down to Capernaum. And Jesus did not do that. Did he give the man a sign? Not really, not at this point in the story anyway. All he gave him was a simple statement, your son will live. And the next sentence is the key phrase in the whole story, the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. He believed. It's that same Greek word, pistuo. It's used 84 plus times in John. Half of the times that word, believe, is used in the New Testament, it's in the book of John. It's in all but two chapters. It's the big idea of the whole book. Believe in Jesus. The man believed what Jesus told him. The NIV says he took him at his word. You know, there's a saying, seeing is believing. But sometimes when it comes to spiritual things, believing is seeing. And that's the case for this official, isn't it? He believed what Jesus said, even though he hadn't seen it, and he goes on his way. And so it's the next day when he finally heads back to Capernaum, and he meets his servants, and they're on his, their way to Cana. They wanna come tell him that his son is getting well. And so he asks them, when did, they, when did he start to recover? And they say, yesterday at the seventh hour, that's our 1 p.m. Yesterday at 1 p.m., the fever began to leave him, and the man realizes that's the exact time that Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. And then look what happened. What's the result? The man 
believed. Wait, I thought he already believed. I thought he believed so strongly that he stopped begging Jesus, got up, went, checked into the embassy suites in Cana, spent the night, had the complimentary breakfast the next morning, and then headed to Capernaum. I think what we see here is a shift. It's a shift in the depth and the quality of his faith. See, for everybody, faith begins with believing that what Jesus says is true. Taking Jesus at his word. That's what the man did. And if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, that's where it began for you. Believing that the words of God recorded in scripture are true. But then, that faith begins to grow through experience. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, haven't you experienced that in your own journey? You believe the word of God. You believe, Jesus, you are the Messiah. You believe, Jesus, you offer me forgiveness of sins and eternal life with you. You, you believe that through Jesus, you can get on a path to an abundant life that lasts forever. But then you start to see the life change. You start to see Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, change you from the inside out, and you start to see him at work all around you. You see your prayers answered, and you believe your faith grows. And then the next logical step is what we see in the story. He believed and all his household. When we see God move, and our faith is strengthened, and we share what's happened, what we've experienced with others, we might see God move in their hearts as well. I want you to imagine this story from their perspective. Think about this family. They've been watching this boy, a mother's son, a sibling, maybe a cousin. They've been watching his health steadily decline. They've seen a fever that looks like it's gonna lead for death to death, worsen for days, maybe weeks. And then suddenly, at one o'clock in the afternoon, the fever leaves. He gets up out of what they literally thought was his deathbed, and he says, what do we got to eat around here? And then the dad comes home, and he tells them the whole story about the encounter with Jesus and how at one o'clock Jesus said, go, your son will live. The sign caused them to believe. The miracle pointed them to Jesus and led them to faith. The miracle achieved its intended purpose. And with that, the man who begged Jesus to come down to Capernaum, he learned a truth that's still applicable for us today. The healing touch of Jesus can reach across any distance. He had in his mind, he's gotta come down here, he's gotta come down here. And what Jesus was showing him was, it doesn't matter where you are, and it doesn't matter where Jesus is. His healing touch can reach across any distance. The man saw beyond the miracle to see the Lord who worked it. No longer was he trying to dictate the terms of his relationship with Jesus. Jesus, I need you to come to where I am. No, now he believed and he understood Jesus can reach across any distance. And this statement is so applicable for us today. However far you feel from God, however great your need, whatever you've done or not done that you think separates you from God, from healing, from wholeness, from forgiveness. Jesus can reach across that distance and touch you. Nobody is beyond the healing touch of Jesus. Not the son of a first century official who laid sick in bed 20 miles away and not a 21st century person anywhere in the world, including right here in Little Fayetteville, Arkansas. And when we think about this miracle, when we think about this 
story that we've been considering together this morning. It's only natural to compare it to last week's miracle. John is asking us to do that. The way he's written this, the way he's put these as parallel episodes, he wants us to consider the two stories. In John chapter two, it took place at a wedding at Cana. In John chapter four, he begins this account with Jesus came again to Cana. In fact, if you were listening when Kim read this, he wants to make sure you make the connection. He goes, you know, Cana, where Jesus turned water into wine? Okay, John, we're with you. In the first episode, there was a problem. The wine ran out. The family is facing this embarrassing social situation. In John chapter four, the problem is the official son is sick and dying. And did you notice that in both cases, it's a parent who comes to Jesus. In John two, it's Jesus' own mother, Mary. She comes to him and says, they're out of wine. In John chapter four, it's the young man's father. He comes to Jesus and says, come heal my son. But in both cases, when the parent presents the problem to Jesus, he actually gives them what I would call a mild rebuke. If you haven't heard last week's teaching and you wanna know why Jesus says to Mary, why are you coming to me with this? My hour's not yet come. Listen to that podcast. Clark did a great job unpacking that. But it feels like he rebukes her a little bit. What does this have to do with me? It's not my time. Same thing today. The man brings the problem. Jesus delivers this mild rebuke. Unless y'all see a sign, y'all will not believe. But in both cases, Jesus turns around and does a miracle. In the first one, he turns 180 gallons of water into the best wine they've ever had. In John chapter four, he speaks a word and the boy is healed 20 miles away. And in both accounts, the last thing that happens is people come to faith. Remember the purpose of the miracles is that we might believe and by believing have life in his name. In John two, it's the disciples who believe in him. Besides the servants and Mary, they're probably the only ones who knew he did a miracle. In John chapter four, it's the man and his whole household who believe the miracle has achieved its intended purpose. And so let's do that critical final step of good Bible study. We've heard the passage. We've looked carefully at the passage. We've compared scripture with other scripture. Now let's see, how does this story apply to us today? The last step of our Bible study should always be to take the biblical story and our story and see how they lay across each other. So here's what we saw in this, the second sign that Jesus did at Cana. We saw the ask. The man went to Jesus and begged him to intervene. He asked Jesus to do something. But then Jesus challenged his suppositions. And the man's response was to believe Jesus told the man something and the man believed it so strongly he acted on that belief. He left there believing that his son had been healed because Jesus said he had. And then when he realized that his son's fever had left at the exact moment Jesus said it had, his faith grew and deepened and the result of his faith growing was that his whole house, household believed along with him. And so for us, it starts with the ask. Maybe you've never done what the official in this story did. Maybe you've never gone to Jesus and asked him to intervene in your life. Maybe you're like the man at the beginning of this story and you're at the end of yourself. Maybe you've discovered that no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you work, no matter what technique you apply, you can't fix what's broken inside of you. And every single one of us eventually has to get to the point that we say, my way is not working. There's gotta be another way. And there is. And all you have to do is ask because Jesus is ready to give you that other way. He's ready to take away your sin. He's ready to remove your shame. 
He's ready to set your feet on a path that leads to wholeness and healing and abundant life. But just like the man in the story, you gotta believe. Seeing's not believing. Believing is seeing. And many of us here in the room this morning, we are followers of Jesus. We do believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the King of the world. He's the Messiah. But the truth is, we're still trying to do life on our own terms. And we need to stop and ask. We need to ask him to fix the things that are broken. We, ask him, we need to ask him to heal. We need to ask him to restore. We need to ask him to bless. And we need to ask him where he wants us to be instead of always telling him where we want him to be. So if you feel far from God, ask him. Ask him to be near because his healing touch can reach across any distance and he wants to. He wants to reach across and touch the lives of his children. And then believe Believe that he's working. Look for his hand to move. Believe the truths of scripture, but then don't ignore the obvious signs of God at work all around you. Believe his word, but then let your faith grow and deepen as you see him at work, both in you, changing you from the inside out, but also all around you as he answers prayers and and moves in other people's lives, and then share it. Share the result. Don't ever be embarrassed to verbally, out loud, give God credit. Whenever somebody says, well, that was a coincidence, (coughs) be ready to say, I don't believe in coincidences. I've actually been praying for that. That was an answered prayer. Peter said, always be prepared to give an answer for the hope you have within you, but do so with gentleness and respect. So fellowship, let's ask Jesus to move in our lives, in our families, in our community. Let's believe that he's working. Let's look for him to respond. And then when people ask, let's share it. Let's be quick to celebrate what Jesus is doing in and through us, in and through this church and all around us in our neighborhoods. Because when we share it, we see in the text what can happen. His whole household believed. And I actually think this is even bigger than what we see in the text. I think that just like a rock goes in the water and the ripples come out, we see the ripples of this actually in another gospel. If you're doing the daily readings that Fellowship provides week after week, you can find them on the discussion guides on the web. They're in your John book. They're in the app. Every morning, I just open the app and do my daily reading. It's right there. If you're doing the daily readings with us, this past week, you were in Luke chapter eight. And at the beginning of Luke eight, Luke is describing some of the women who are following Jesus. And one of them just jumped off the page at me as I read it. In Luke chapter eight, verse three, he mentions Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's household Manager. Man, remember what we said at the beginning. This royal official, he was probably an official in the household of Herod, Herod Antipas. I thought to myself, could it be that Cusa, the household manager mentioned in Luke 8, is actually the official? Was it Cusa who went to Jesus and Jesus healed his son? Was Joanna the follower of Jesus, the mother of the boy? I don't know. Could be. Or it could be that Cusa and Joanna aren't the boy's parents, but they know the boy's parents. Maybe they were firsthand eyewitnesses. Maybe Joanna saw this boy suddenly get well and then heard from the boy's father what Jesus had done. All I know is somehow the gospel message of Jesus penetrated Herod's household and changed Joanna, and she began to follow Jesus. And Luke mentions her in Luke 8, and he mentions her one other time. You know where it is? At the tomb, in the garden. Joanna's there. 
She's an eyewitness of the resurrection. And I can't help but wonder if her journey of faith all started with a desperate official turning to Jesus, asking, believing, and then celebrating the results. Results that we're still talking about today. That's the power of miracles. They're signs that point us not to the miracle, but to the one who does them. Signs that point us to faith in Christ, whose healing touch can reach across any distance. Hey, let's pray. Father, thank you for this story. Thank you that by the power of your Holy Spirit, John recorded this, and it's been preserved so that we can read it and be encouraged by it today. Lord, help us be a people that ask, a people that believe, and a people that celebrate the results when you move. Lord, help us just stand amazed in the presence of Jesus. 